Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome back to A House Divided, coming to you from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. If it's on our shelves, it's history. My name is Bjorn Skaptison. I will be your host for today's event. And today's event will be a discussion with author Hampton Newsom about Gettysburg's Southern Front, Opportunity and Failure at Richmond. Newsom. We're going to talk about Hampton Newsom. Hampton Newsom is an attorney from Arlington, Virginia, and is the author of a couple of fine military histories of the Civil War, including Richmond Must Fall, the Richmond Petersburg Campaign, October 1864, and the Fight for the Old North State, the Civil War in North Carolina, January to May 1864. Hampton is speaking for himself today alone and for no other entity. The book we are talking about is Gettysburg Southern Front, Opportunity and Failure at Richmond. It comes to us from the University Press of Kansas, whom we thank for publishing it and helping us to publicize this event. You will be getting a first edition copy. The book is 411 pages long. It is illustrated. It has great maps. It will cost you $36.95, and we will ship it right out to you. Hampton Newsom, welcome to A House Divided. Hey, thanks for having me. This is great. I, re I really appreciate it. And I need to get back to Chicago. I have not been there in a while. Last time I was there, I popped by. We had a good discussion. And uh, whenever uh, my friends are headed to Chicago, I'm always like, well, go to the Lincoln Bookshop. You know, even the folks that are not um, maybe huge uh, people interested in the Civil War, um, it's a fascinating place all the all the books and and all the more importantly the other stuff there yeah. it's just a, a great place to visit so next time i'm thank you in town i will uh I, I look forward to dropping by and saying hi in person but thanks so much for having me today sure sure glad to have you here and thank you for pointing out yes we are an antiquarian bookshop that deals in books about the civil war and abraham lincoln but we also have monu uh artifacts manuscripts we have art bookends, a really good one too. Um, and uh, all sorts of other, all sorts of other uh, Lincolniana, uh, which is the term of art for our stuff. So let's, but let's get into this book, Hampton. I've been reading Gettysburg Southern Front and enjoying it hugely. Uh, people do need to, to read this book and learn about this, learn this new information. But one thing I've noticed, all three of these books, and other people have uh, have mentioned it, uh, Andrew Wagenhofer mentioned it in a uh, review that I saw earlier today that you showed me, that you seem to have an affinity for writing about those overlooked military campaigns. There's something about that campaign that just has never before had a study that seems to catch your imagination. Why is that? Well, I think when I first started writing, I you know my first book was about uh, a cam a part of the Petersburg campaign that no one had really spent a lot of time on. Um, there were some chapters and some books. Andy Trudeau's book, I remember reading it and thinking, well, this is really interesting. There's this huge uh, offensive before the November election in 1864 outside Petersburg, and. Um, I just started, I thought, well, maybe I'll write an article about it. And then the article became a book. And uh, I really enjoyed it because they, the in the research, you're, you're looking yeah, for stuff. It. There it is. Yeah. yeah. From Kent, Kent State, um, published about a decade ago. And um, when you're, when you're researching, you're, you're finding stuff that a lot of people have not looked for before and much less, you know, considered. And so, it gives the whole project kind of a fresh feel. And when I, the second book I wrote was about the operations in Eastern North Carolina in uh, 1864. We also um, that. Yeah, the Battle of Plymouth, the New Bern Expedition, the Ironclads, lots of interesting things. And again, you know, it had been touched before, but um, but not in kind of the scope that I I was trying to get. And so that that was interesting. With this book, Gettysburg Southern Front. Uh, it's something that almost no one has ever 
heard of before. And I, when I give talks, you know, as I was working on this book the last couple of years and giving talks about, you know, other titles and things like that, I would always, well, not always, but sometimes I'd ask the, the audience, and these are round tables. These are people that know their stuff. I said, has anyone ever heard of the Blackberry Raid? Did any, does anyone know that there was this federal advance, offensive, whatever you want to call it, outside of Richmond during the Gettysburg campaign? And there'll be a couple of people that raise their hands, but generally it's not a very well-known thing. And so that, you know, that being said, it's just, you know, it's it's a real pleasure as a researcher and writer to dig into something like that. And with the Civil War, it's hard to find stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, you know, there are 18 Robert E. Lee cookbooks or whatever. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so you know, everything's been covered a lot. And so I felt uh, you know, really lucky to have stumbled into this project, particularly, and also the other projects. Um, you know, I usually start these thinking, well, let's see where it goes. Let's, uh, and I, I, at the beginning, I was thinking, I, I don't know if this is a book, but there was so much interesting stuff that I ran into, uncovered, what have you, related to these operations that, um, you know, I felt like it really worked out into a you know, a, 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 a full study of this, you know, little known operation that I found fascinating. I certainly think it's fascinating. And, but I have to admit, this also hits a soft spot with me because in a lot of the history work that I do, I love talking about whether it's in a battle or, or in the Civil War, I love talking about the battles that don't happen. Because there are so many, for every big battle, there's another, at least one other campaign where the leaders make decisions and somebody decides to do something and the armies get out and they march and they go back and forth and then no battle occurs. And these can be very important military campaigns. They just don't result in a big battle and they do result, as the folks who read this book will know, we'll see in really fascinating fighting. So there is fighting in the Blackberry Raid. It's just, it didn't result in a great big battle that you can hang on the dust jacket of your book uh, necessarily. Although you do make the point that this is part of the Gettysburg campaign. Now, what do we call this campaign? Do we call it the Dix campaign, the Blackberry Raid? Is it all just one campaign or is there more than one thing happening? I think it's, well, there, there's certainly more than one thing happening, but the focus of the book is the um, is John Dix's operation outside Richmond uh, in June and July of 1863. Um, and so we, you know, we can call it the Blackberry Raid uh, as it's sometimes called. Sometimes it's called Dix's Peninsula Campaign because uh, he brought his his forces, about 20,000 men. It was not a small operation. 20,000 men to White House Landing there on the Pamunkey, just a few miles east of Richmond. Um, and so, in a sense, it was kind of his peninsula campaign. Now, there were other things going on, but um, but as you say, the what results, in, you know, and spoiler alert, he's moving on Richmond, and we can talk a little bit about how his orders and and the the whole uh, that this was something that was kind of cooked up by Henry Halleck, but um, it did you know it did result in several engagements uh, that I found quite interesting and and made quite interesting chapters in the book. And then there was a lot of other stuff um, that you know that we can get into. But mm -hmm. Blackberry Raid you know sounds good and and the book Kansas did a great job. Um, the the uh, the book, the beginning, beginning of the chapters. I don't know if this will show up, but there's oh, yeah. black blackberry there, mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, I I love working with Kansas Press and um, jo Joyce Harrison and uh, Kelly Christman Christman Jacks and uh, Derek Helms. We were talking about You're before talking about, we went yeah. on, and they, then they also, always produce really well designed books. Yeah, and great, and I also have to praise because I'm I'm a copy editor's nightmare. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I have to praise John Howard. I've never met him, but he he did the copy editing on this and did a great job um, mm -hmm. catching 
you know, many of my boneheaded mistakes and things like that. So it was great right, to work right. with So them. we definitely, I think we can agree that in addition to this book, we do recommend titles from the University Press of Kansas in Lawrence. And because uh, they, yeah, they put out some great books, well-designed books, books that you'll want to have the hard copy, you know, you want to have that dust jacket and you'll love looking at it on your bookshelf. Now let's talk, let's talk about John A. Dix, because this is not a, a guy who is at the top level of union generals. Um, so tell us about Tell us about Dix. Dix, I think Dix represents a certain kind of general, specifically you see on the Union side, uh, someone that doesn't have a lot of capacity as a field commander, but does a lot of stuff as an administrative commander. Uh, what do you think about John Dix? Absolutely. I, I, it was fascinating um, to kind of dig into Dix because you know, Dix, is, he's in charge of this operation. He is responsible at the time, he is head of the what they call the Department of Virginia, uh, which you know is based down at Fort Monroe, and they had he had packets of men at Norfolk and Yorktown and different places like that. Dix is probably you know when you're going to list the 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 uh, more prominent, I guess well known at the time at least political generals of the war. Uh, Dix is going to fall into that list. He, he was. Uh, uh, around 60 at the time of the war. He had a very long life of substantial um, public service. He had been a politician, served in the Senate. Um, he actually was, he was, um, he was uh, involved in the War of 1812. He was, uh, you know, when he was very, very young. So he had some military experience, but most of his experience involved, uh, you know, being a, a public servant, uh, and uh, and in fact, he was before at the very beginning of the war, before the Lincoln administration um, took over, he was the Secretary of, Tre of Treasury. And at the time, there with the um, when federal inst installations were being um, captured, uh, he sent out famously a um, note to his. Uh, his office or whatever in New Orleans, where there were revenue cutters for the treasury. And he said that if anyone attempts to pull down the, uh, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, the US flag, shoot them on the spot. And uh, this became uh, kind of a rallying cry, kind of a famous thing, at least at the time. Uh, it was, this, this statement was put on these little tokens, they call them Dick's tokens. I don't know if you ever run into them. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, I, you know, I've seen pictures of them online. So he was a, you know, very, very interesting guy in that regard. Now, during the war, he was, you know, he's a Democrat, so he's uh, valuable to the Lincoln administration. A, you know, a, a, a war Democrat, as they say, someone who really uh, was behind the war. He supported Lincoln. He did not agree with a lot of the policies, but he was very clear that he supported Lincoln in the war. So he was. He was very valuable and helpful um, to the Union cause during the war. He was not a, uh, a, a big advocate of emancipation. Um, you know, he had uh, very conservative views on, uh, you know, the use of uh, Black troops and, and things like that. Um, and so there were certainly, you know, a complicated figure. Um, but the bottom line for this book is, He's probably not the guy that you want if you want some aggressive military operation, someone to lead an aggressive military operation, say to capture Richmond or to wreak havoc um, outside Richmond. Right, right. And indeed, his, as, as you will see when you read the book, and we're not going to try to tell you the story of the book in this conversation. You want to buy <laughs> the book and we'll ship it to you. We just want you to understand how fascinating it is. But you're also going to find out that... While Dix is a political general, he has military generals under him who are very experienced, but they don't seem to be much more aggressive than he is. Am I right about that? That that's right. Well, well, there are three principal um, people under him, so uh, officers. So uh, George Washington Getty, who 
actually develops a very good reputation later on in the war, in the 1864 campaigns. Um, he, he is uh, heading one of the corps. Um, he, he does, as you'll see, he conducts a very large infantry raid up to the South Anna as part of this operation. Doesn't do very well, but he does probably a little better than the, uh, one of the other subordinates, Erasmus Keyes, who is, uh, is charged with conducting a, a, a demonstration against Richmond towards Bottoms Bridge and the, and the fortifications outside Richmond. And um, I'm not sure he could have screwed that operation up um, more if he, you know, if he tried. And uh, it's kind of an interesting story. And, and he's up against the main Confederate commander. Here's uh, D.H. Hill. And D.H. Hill is very aggressive and just kind of um, um, knocks keys around. And then the third is Samuel Spear, someone who people don't know a whole lot about. Um, he commanded at the time the 11th Pennsylvania Cavalry. And he actually conducts the initial op operation when Dix arrives at Richmond um, and, and is, is fairly successful and burns one of the key railroad bridges over the, um, over the South Anna. And these, these are important because these are the supply lines to Lee's army in Pennsylvania. And that's kind of the whole point of this operation, to threaten Richmond, to threaten these supply lines to Lee. And, and so Spear, is actually kind of the star of the show, but after that initial um, foray, he, he's kind of, he's not really given a lot of responsibility. So it's an interesting kind of study in command here. You've got Dix, you've got these other people. Keyes is pretty much relieved after this, um, after this operation and you don't really see him anymore in the war. Um, so I think as one person, Bob, Bobby Crick, who helped a lot with this book, a historian in Richmond with the Park Service, he, he described it as um, you've got kind of the B team uh, outside of Richmond going against Richmond and uh, against D.A. Hill. So, well, let's, yeah, let's take quickly, if you could, let's take a step back and put this entire book and where you're talking about the Gettysburg Southern Front into the context of the Gettysburg campaign. Now, what's, what are the dates and what's going on? Where is Lee? while this is going on and what is the opportunity that Dix has in front of him? Or does he think he has an opportunity, but he doesn't really have an opportunity? I don't know. Well, yeah, so there, you know, there are a lot of moving parts. Mm -hmm. um, Lee heads off toward Pennsylvania in early June and he's, uh, he, he's uh, marching into the valley up into Pennsylvania and there's a lot going on. There's the whole thing with Hooker and the Halleck and Lincoln, and then there are questions about, well, where's Lee going and why is he going and all these things. And these are all things that I discuss in the book. But as he's heading up and as Halleck, who's kind of gen general in chief in Washington, he's responsible for kind of coordinating everything and trying to make sure, you know, everything's operating smoothly. And in the midst of preparing for dealing with Lee's incursion into uh, the North, he has an idea. So he knows he has Dix. Dix has 30,000 men in his department, not far from Richmond, east of Richmond. And so Halleck issues orders, and they're very confusing orders, but he issues orders to Dix saying that, hey, you, I would like you to head west toward Richmond and threaten the city and, if, and burn the rail bridges. There, there are two railroads heading north Richmond that eventually, you know, provide kind of a, a line of communication supply line for Lee. And I want you to burn those, um, those bridges. And, you know, depending on how you read his orders, you know, if possible, attack Richmond. Um, and so that's, Dix has those orders. Most of the book is about Dix's operation, as we said, the Blackberry raid, what have you. But also Halleck had orders John Foster, who's in command in North Carolina of the Union forces in those enclaves that were captured early in the war, New Bern being the largest one, he tells Foster to hit the railroad in North Carolina, the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad, which is a vital supply line up to Richmond. And he also orders troops in West Virginia to hit the, the railroad in the western part of Virginia that's coming in from Tennessee. So Halleck has this, he has this plan. And 
very few people have kind of written about it or recognized it, but it's kind of this counterstroke. It, it's a uh, to to Lee's invasion, and that's to threaten Richmond with a large force under Dix, threaten the supply lines in North Carolina, the railroad, and then threaten that railroad in Western Virginia. It's a half-baked, very um, not very well supported plan. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't give it a lot of care and feeding. He's not talking to Dix once he kind of sends Dix to Richmond, but it, it is kind of a plan. And I thought it was kind of interesting that in addition to reacting to Lee, trying to get as many men, you know, the Army of the Potomac and other units up into uh, Pennsylvania to counter Lee, Halleck was also thinking about this counterstroke. Right. Well, you can see what you can see what Halleck had in mind when you see that great big Confederate army marching into Pennsylvania. There must be nobody in Richmond. So who was in Richmond and what did what does Robert E. Lee's gone? So what mm -hmm. does this threat look like from the point of view of, say, Jefferson Davis? Yeah. So that's a that's a good question. So in Richmond, by 1863, Richmond has a pretty substantial uh, network of um, fortifications around it. It's actually like three layers, uh, pretty substantial. They have the, um, the different names for it, but kind of the local defense forces, the garrison that are uh, heavy artillery units, what have you, that are assigned to Richmond. Uh, and, and that's a couple thousand. And then there are these kind of emergency units that come from the factories and the office workers. Those are commanded by uh, Robert E. Lee's son, Custis Lee, uh, and that adds a couple of thousand. And then during this time, I mean, when, when Lee is heading up into Pennsylvania, there's a lot of discussion about from Richmond about well, what are you, if you go up there, what are you going to leave us here in Richmond? And there's a lot of um, back and forth, and there's there's kind of this, this acrimonious exchange between um, D.H. Hill, who commands the kind of Southern De Virginia Department, North Carolina Department, about what troops he's going to have and what troops Lee's going to have. Well, this results in leaving, uh, depending on how you count it, about three or four uh, veteran brigades, or at least you know brigades that had been with Lee or in active operation at Richmond. So the total in Richmond ends up being not terribly small, um, about 13,000 men. Uh, about half of those are probably, uh, you, you know, uh, tested veterans. And and Dix is bringing 20,000. So he has more, but he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have that. When you read military stuff, they always say you want a three to one advantage. He doesn't have that magic three to one advantage. Yeah, he doesn't have three to one, and he doesn't have three to one, and he's going to be attacking really strong forts. If we were, spoiler alert, if we jumped into 1864, uh, when, let's say, the Fort Harrison attack, when, mm -hmm. again, those civilians were brought out to defend the undefended forts, they did very well in 1864. We can, uh, we might be able to infer that had Dick's thrown all 20,000 troops against the Richmond defenses that they they might have just gotten killed. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's an interesting what if. They, it may have been a disaster for Dix, um, depending on where, how he managed it, where he uh, tested the, the, uh, the fortifications, maybe, you know, something could have happened. So it just, you know, for him, some success. But it's, the, so, so there, you know, there's that kind of what if aspect. Dix, when you look at his his dispatches, his letters at the time, it's something he's seriously considering, and he meets with his officers mm -hmm. several times to discuss, like, well, should we go right after Richmond, or should we, you know, focus on these rail bridges that are connecting Lee? But it wasn't only Dix who was talking about this. This was discussed at length in in Washington. Um, because, you know, and, the, and this another thing, you know, this is not something people see a lot, but when you look at, say, Gideon Wells, who has, you know, this great diary like talk, that talks about all the details, all these things that happened during cabinet meetings and stuff. And, and you can see that in late June, 
in early July, and this is when Dix is conducting these operations, right during the fighting at Gettysburg, pretty much. Um, there is substantial discussion with Lincoln and um, his cabinet about whether they should reinforce Dix. 20,000, maybe not much, but if you pull 15,000 from North Carolina and maybe you replace Dix with John Foster, who's a more competent at, in terms of military stuff, uh, then you know maybe there's a chance. And, and um, you know, Secretary Chase, he was the biggest advocate of this. And he even, he said, why don't we get Foster or why don't we get Hooker who had recently been relieved from you know, the Army of the Potomac? Why don't we go send him down to replace Dix? So that's another issue there. And th this was, it was, you know, top of mind. I don't know if that, that's maybe a little too much, but it was something that was discussed in detail that in Washington, they recognized that this was a, uh, an opportunity. And some around Lincoln thought, mm, I, we really need to focus on Lee in Pennsylvania. And that's kind of what won out. Mm -hmm. uh, but others were pushing for, to reinforce this. Why don't we take try to take Richmond now? Um, so yeah. interesting discussions. Well, I think also what you're bringing up there, Hampton, is something about this book and something about this campaign that gives you this opportunity is the just to remind the folks at home. And I know the folks at home know this, but they need they can't hear it enough as far as I'm concerned. All military campaigns are political and they all involve political interactions. And there's always a political aspect. There's always a social aspect to it in some ways. There's always cultural. It, it's history. And so, this, but this opportunity, this topic gives you more opportunity, I think, than even more famous topics like Gettysburg to say, well, what is Lincoln doing? What does Chase say? Gideon Wells has something to say about this, and Dix mm -hmm. is a political general. So a lot of politics are going on in the Union side, and, and the parts of this book that discuss the political controversies going on in both capitals are fascinating. And this is, this is also a Lincoln book, and this is also a cabinet book. This is also, this is what I want to bring up here, this is also a very political opportunity for the Confederates. And if there's one single tiny little nugget of political history that seems to find itself into the Gettysburg campaign, it's always that somehow the Confederates were ready to negotiate a peace if only Lee could defeat the Union Army in Pennsylvania. But they never follow up on that. Okay, you do. <laughs> Here's Alexander Stevens. Alexander Stevens wants to go to Washington. Alexander Stevens has an idea. He has a plan, and he goes right into the middle of your campaign, Hampton. So tell us about the political, the political aspect, the political opportunity that the Confederates think they see in the midst of the Blackberry Raid. Yeah, that, this was an interesting aspect of the that, that at the beginning, I wasn't thinking I, you know, I, I would really address this, but it, then I, I saw it as, as kind of integral to the story. And that's, so Alexander Stevens, he, you know, he's the Confederate vice president. He spends a lot of the war in Georgia at, at you know, his plantation down there. Um, he's not in Richmond, you know, he'll go for visits in Richmond. And after Chancellorsville, he thinks, you know, this is a good time to start talking um, negotiations with, uh, you know, with with Lincoln's administration, you know, that kind of thing. And he, um, so he writes, President Davis says, you know, why don't we do this? Davis says, come on up. And this is, you know, this is in June. This is while all of this is happening. Um, Stevens gets to Richmond. He wants to, like you said, he wants to go uh, and, he, you know, he wants to go and, and conduct this kind of peace mission can call it. Um, and when he gets to Richmond, he realizes that Lee has, has launched this campaign and he thinks this is not the time to do it, but he's kind of overruled by Davis and the rest of the cabinet. And, uh, and so he, he um, embarks on this mission. Now, the way it is discussed, the way it is packaged, uh, 
what you can see in, in Alexander Stevens' letters, the ones that you can read, I, I, I got his original letters, lots of interesting stuff. It's impossible to read his handwriting. <laughs> um, and, and then, you know, like if you've seen how he writes, he writes in these very long, very confusing, it's kind of, to me, it's just kind of hard what he's getting at. But when you read between the lines, you know, what, what Davis and, and Stevens are talking about in terms of kind of a negotiation is they, they want to talk about the prisoner cartel and that this, this is the exchange of prisoners that actually um, developed by Dix and D.H. Hill. It's called the, uh, you know, the Dix Hill cartel. And um, interestingly, because those are the two generals here at this thing. But so, so Stevens wants to, wants to do this, but when you read between the lines and you see what he really wants to do is talk about uh, negotiating kind of a peace and into the war. And he hopes to do this. Uh, and so this is a piece of the story. Like, the, so while all these things are going on, literally, like during, during the fighting at Gettysburg, um, Stevens is getting on a boat, going down the James River, going to Fort Monroe to request an audience in Washington. Um, and, uh, and so he, you know, he's kind of, and while like get July 3rd, July 4th, you know, these are important dates, his boat, you know, it's kind of, I just picture it bobbing there along the James. He's waiting to hear word that, that his request goes up to Lincoln. They all talk about it up there and there are different views, just like there are different views on what Dix should do. And, uh, and while they're deliberating, they get the news from Gettysburg about the, um, about the victory. And they basically write um, Stevens and they say, no thanks, you know? And so Stevens goes back up. And so we never really know what Stevens was going to propose, but one of the fascinating little, um, uh, you know, the, the, the little threads that I found was this column that was published a couple of weeks later in uh, the New York Tribune by a reporter who had who who contributed to the Tribune, but he was uh, um, maybe I'm maybe getting it wrong, maybe the Herald, but he had Confederate. He was kind of a Confederate sympathizer. He in fact wrote that that the poem or the or the song Stonewall Jackson's Way, John Williamson Palmer, and he sends this column that gets published in a paper, and in it they say it's Stevens and this failed diplomatic attempt. What he was really trying to do was he was going to threaten um, to arm the enslaved people in the South if he didn't get any traction at the bargaining table. Now, whether that was like a good bargaining strategy for him, who knows, and whether it even was true or not, it's not clear. There's no other, nothing else to corroborate it. But I found it fascinating. This was many, many months before Patrick Cleburne raises the issue of the Confederacy arming um, enslaved people. And, uh, and the, you know, there, there's talk early in the war once in a while about this, but this is there, it's in this New York paper. It, it mm -hmm. created a little bit of a, a stir. Uh, Stevens, we know with all his letters, he's obsessed with the fact that the North are, um, are creating uh, black regiments. And this is something, you know, he, he's a, obsessed with um, insurrection and all of these issues, like a lot of the Southern leaders. And so I, you know, I just found that a fascinating little piece of that diplomatic thing. It um, is. And, and it, it may, you know, I'm sorry, I went on about it for a while. No, no, uh, it, it, it's a fascinating <laughs> part of your book. And it's uh, an excellent opportunity to look at, at an episode of the Gettysburg campaign that's very important. And this is a great place to tell that story. Hey, for those of you who are watching at home, I can see that a number of you are out there. I want to say hello to you. Dave Bradley is watching from the UK, where it is cold, we are told. And uh, Bill Gorski is here in Arlington Heights. Bill Shepard is watching from Gurney. And Bill Shepard has a question for you, Hampton. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to remind everybody that is watching, if you have a question for Hampton Newsom, go ahead and put it right there in the comments section of this Facebook uh, feed, of this live feed. Uh, I have plenty of questions to ask Hampton, but I would just as soon you ask your questions uh, because, uh, because you're hearing about this for the first time. I know you've got questions. So here's what Bill Shepard wants to know, uh, Hampton. 
could could you tell us how the could you tell us how you first heard of this union operation and what primary and secondary sources did you use to tell the story in the book? Sure. So the so the idea came from a veteran researcher writer in D.C. Bryce Sudero and. Bryce, uh, I've known him for years, and and he he has a lot of ideas, and um, and I talk to him once in a while about you know books and things like that, and he said, well, why don't you do something on the BlackBerry raid? And I said, what's the BlackBerry raid? <laughs> and so uh, so that started me on this you know journey of uh, looking up these these things, and and uh, in terms of sources, uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a real, I, I try to throw a wide net. Um, and for this one, you know, obviously any military study, you're going to look at the reports that are in the official records. Uh, that's kind of a standard thing. But, you know, I, I went to National Archives and looked through the, um, you know, the, the order books for the various corps that were involved in, in this operation and uh, tried to dug, dig up whatever you know, I could find on that. Um, the letters uh, from collections, uh, regimentals, you know, things like that, they're all very useful. For me, um, one thing I found in my writing that has been particularly helpful and, and a great source of kind of fresh information or information no one's really looked at before are, uh, are the newspapers. And I think 30, 40 years ago, it's kind of like, well, the newspapers, they're, you know, they're unreliable, they're, you know, the, the, the articles are fourth hand or whatever, but the gold mine in the newspapers, and everyone's, you know, kind of figured this out now that all of this is digitized in the last decade or two, is that they're full of these letters from soldiers. And I find the letters in the newspapers from soldiers even more um, helpful than letters that are, say, in, you know, letter collections at, at, at uh, uh, university, you know, collections, that kind of thing. Because the, the ones that are in the paper are aimed at a general reader, and they're talking about, like, this is what happened during the battle, this is where we went. Whereas a lot of the ones that are, are aimed at home are not necessarily, you know, maybe the family's not interested in all of the those details and they're more interested in how the soldier was doing and that kind of thing. So that's, you know, I found a lot of interesting stuff uh, in the newspapers, but it's always a broad. Right. Broad well, newspapers, are, newspapers are a new untapped, being tapped gold mine yeah. uh, or a seam, a new gold seam in uh, primary sources, because I think, I mean, there always has been a reason to be skeptical of news writing but so many now that we can actually see what's in those newspapers especially the local newspapers i know you used a lot of new york stuff but uh the local newspapers are filled with soldier correspondents whose purpose is to try to explain what happened to them and i, I when i find those i find them very very helpful yeah, and in terms of their, you know, one thing you always do in these, when when you're look, doing a study like this is you, you're going to be very skeptical of anything that's written after the war, memoirs and even letter, letters, um, you know, to, to newspapers decades after the war, because, you know, I, I mean, I can't remember what I had for breakfast this morning. So, you know, someone trying to remember what um, what they did, you know, during the war. But these letters that are the contemporaneous ones in the hometown newspapers, they don't have that issue. So they're particularly yeah. helpful. Well, one of the things that impressed me is, is you earlier mentioned that the cavalry raid by Colonel Spear ended up being a really interesting chapter, an interesting story for you to, to write. And indeed, it does result in a military conflict, which is between two forces that compared to the Battle of Gettysburg are extraordinarily small, just a really small forces. But it also is a battle that ends up in this bloody scrum 
at the bridge where men are fighting hand to hand and they're fighting with club muskets and their cavalry. So they're, sh they're stabbing each other and cutting at each other with sabers dismounted. And you find just reading it without going to your footnotes. I look, there are so many quotes, so many observations, so many different individual private soldiers in a battle that had a couple hundred men in it. And you were able to create a really compelling whole chapter about this tiny conflict. I'm not yeah, sure what my question is, other than no, the well, I, I, well, hey, I, and you I'm found some really great stuff. And it was a great story, you know, and we need to know about tiny, tiny battles. They can be mm -hmm. fascinating. Yeah, I, I think that when I was writing this, I was at the beginning, I was like, well, there's not going to be a lot of military, you know, kind of classic, what do they call it? Drums and bugles kind of yeah. stuff. Um, but, you know, the engagements that did happen, that it's, there hasn't been a lot written about it. Um, and I was doing a lot of digging. I dug up a lot of stuff. And, and that particular engagement there at the Virginia Central Bridge, this is north of um, Hanover in Hanover County, um, it, it, the, you've got about a thousand U.S. cavalrymen coming to burn the bridge, and you've got about two, what is it, two companies of North Carolina troops there guarding the bridge. Um, it's not an even contest. The, the, uh, the Carolinians managed to make it a, a long one, though. And as you said, there's this really chaotic, violent, um, uh, conclusion to it, where there's all this hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and you know, I talk about you, know, you see all these paintings of hand-to-hand -hand fighting and the Civil War, and it certainly happened, but it was not the rule. But it certainly happened at there at, at the South Hand on June 26, and um, and so it, it just was, you know, to and also there's the challenge, and I talk a lot about this in in the text and also in the footnote of putting together all these witnesses, you know, all these statements and accounts and trying to fit them together. And, you know, you're never going to get it perfectly. And if somebody looks at the same material, they might, you know, have um, set up the story a little differently. But I just, I just felt, I was surprised at how uh, interesting that was. Um, and it, and it did have, it had an impact because Spear, who's there, he, he burns that one bridge because he wins that battle against you know, with his, his 10 to one advantage, but it takes him so long, he doesn't have time to go to the other bridge, the RFMP bridge that um, is also important to connecting, you know, the supply lines up into uh, Stanton or Culpeper and wherever Lee was drawing his, um, now primarily ammunition, but he was getting most of, um, you know, provisions and stuff just from Pennsylvania. But anyway, and then the other piece of that whole, chapter is the uh the fact that Robert E. Lee's son, Rooney Lee, who was right, who was wounded at <laughs> go Brandy ahead. Station. I was gonna ask. <laughs> oh, is that a question? Okay. I was gonna ask. So, go ahead. So yeah. the other the other little piece of this is that so the so Rooney Lee um at Brandy Station, he's hit in the thigh and he does not participate in the Gettysburg campaign. He goes and convalesces at his um his wife's aunt and uncle's place. I'm, I think I'm getting that right. Um, Hickory Hill, which is right there um, in Hanover County. And it's only a few miles from where this fight we're talking about occurs at the bridge. And Rooney Lee is, he's, he's convalescing there. He's, they have this separate like little house for him. And, and a, a bunch of Spearsmen show up that morning and capture him. And uh, you know, I will not get into the details of it. It's kind of interesting. One of the main, the most interesting part is that different different perspectives or the different stories you get the the Lee family having you know one view about the participation of the enslaved people and this capture and then other accounts from union soldiers and and elsewhere that provide kind of a different view and so that was kind of interesting to look at but Lee is you know so Rooney Lee's captured and so in addition to burning the bridge they have Robert e. Lee's son they bring him down um, as a prisoner and it right. you know leads to a lot of mess over the next couple of months about prisoner exchange and stuff like that. So, 
Hey, we, we do have another couple of questions from uh, Daniel Weinberg, who's owner of the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, and he's he's uh, also watching this and really enjoying it. Dan, Dan has a comment in that he, he says, I don't think there ever could have been a political solution to the war. Neither Lincoln or Davis would compromise on their core principles. Uh, and Dan asks, do, do you think he's correct about that? From the point of view of the political negotiation that might have occurred with Stevens. Yeah, th that's a big question. I, I, I think, so actually I'm currently working on a book about the Appomattox campaign. Oh. And so as part of the trying to fit the pieces together, uh, you know, I, I'm looking at, you know, some of the things that happened in April 65 with, you know, delegations and peace conferences and all that kind of thing. Okay. I, I yeah. Oh, go ahead. You were finishing? Just, just I, I would say, at least from Davis's standpoint, I think that's a very accurate statement. He mm -hmm. didn't seem to, I mean, maybe if the negotiation led to Confederate independence, but at least in 1865, he seemed very dug in and very unwilling to, um, you know, to kind of give up the give up the uh, the fight there. So right. And then but, Daniel asks a second question, which I think harkens back to what we were just talking about with Rooney Lee and all that. Dan wants to know: Are there any battlefields from this campaign that a person could go and visit? That are, yeah, we all, now we all love to tramp battlefields. Yeah, but so there. I know you can visit that house where Rooney Lee was captured. Yes, yes, and I, I don't. It was sold recently. I don't know what mm -hmm. its its status is in terms of its, you know, privately owned. But the um, so there there are three primary um, engagements that happened here. One is at that bridge we were talking about, and that is probably looks very close to what it looked like. Back then, there's no there's no housing development. There there is a, I can't remember some kind of industrial facility nearby, but where the actual fighting happened, the railroad's still there. I think it follows um, the same path that it did. The other fight at the uh, at night on July fourth at the RFNP bridge, where Getty's huge infantry uh, raid that tried to take and burn that bridge. That most of that is on private land, but it's very close to I-95. And when you drive around, you can see, you know, many parts of the, the field there. And then the um, the Keys battle the, um, in New Kent County, Crump's Crossroads, as I call it in the book, is uh, and I'm blanking on the modern name of it, but it's uh, it's very it's right there. There's you know intersections right there there I think there are a few shops or stores there but you can definitely see the the terrain there so that was kind of nice um you know and in, in terms of like visiting the spots and getting a feel for the um what's there I also extensively use lidar uh to you know figure out whether there are traces of um of uh earthworks and things like that um and that also you know, if you can't always get to every spot because you you know you're not going to go tramping around private land and stuff like that, so that was kind of interesting to see too because there are traces of earthworks at you know some of these places. So yeah, well perhaps it's a uh, perhaps the good folks at Civil War Trails if they haven't already uh, uh, thought of putting up some waysides for these have some uh, opportunities here. Yes, I I I love Civil War Trails. I I just you know. Um, the stuff that they do, I, I don't, you know, it's just a couple of people and mm -hmm. I don't understand how, you know, they're getting all of this stuff done, um, <laughs> but it's really great. And, you know, they work in partnership with the local communities. And so it's part history, part um, boosting tourism for the local area. But um, yeah, maybe some, maybe some markers for these things um, might be a possibility. Yeah. Well, Hampton, we're, we are nearing the end of our time here, and I do want to propose an idea that we talked about before we started here. And I know it's not specifically from your book, but I want, I took it. I, I read it, whether you wrote it or not. And it's this, we have had folks who like to read Civil War history have had a series of books over the last few years that take 
a different look at the overall view of what the war was about from the point of view of the writer. And in my opinion, it has not been, I, I haven't heard any historian put a flag in the ground and say, let's do this. But there have been a number of books, and yours, and this one fits the description, that approach the war, the Civil War, as a war of liberation. Not necessarily a war about states' rights or about the Union and the Confederacy, a war of liberation, a war where people are liberated. And I would highly recommend other writings by uh, Stephen Ash, Firebrand of Liberty, fits in there. And Gordon Cottom wrote a terrific little book about Juneteenth last year, which we have available. Both of them tell the stories of military operations, military histories, military operations that resulted in freedom, in liberation of people who were enslaved. And if nothing came of capturing Richmond, and if nothing came of burning those bridges, a ubiquitous thread that runs through your book is enslaved people following and fleeing to the Union lines and winning their freedom. And a story of a liberating army that moves through the tidewater and comes out with hundreds or thousands of newly freed people. Did you see that as one of the central themes when you started to research this? How many people got away, got free? Yeah, I, I when I started this project, that was not something that I planned on focusing on. Um, but you know, when I started this project, I was just looking at everything uh, for the first time. But as I researched and as I wrote, I realized that there was this consistent thread throughout these operations. Whenever Dix's forces were in the field outside Richmond, conducting raids, moving around, they were consistently aided by enslaved people who would, who would come up to the columns and they would say, the Confederates are five miles over there, or you can't cross down here because the bridge is out, but there's a ford over here, over and over and over again. And for me, it was pretty compelling. And as a, as a so, so that became a important part of this story. Um, that at the time, as you know, I discussed in the book, there were no USCT units in the Virginia Department. Dix was actually kind of hostile to, to that. But in these operations, in addition to, in the operations, there was this constant um, assistance to the, to, the, um, to the US forces. And in addition, there were many enslaved people that when the columns came by, they took the opportunity to, to leave and free themselves. And that was, that's also an important part of the story. And this is, it's not surprising, right? So th this, is, this is everywhere. These issues are everywhere if you just look for them and, you know, and these military operations. And, uh, you know, you mentioned a couple of books. Another very good one that goes into much more detail than I do is Glenn Brasher's book about the 1862 uh, campaigns. Um, very true. And, and these themes are things that he really, you know, goes into detail on. And these are the, you know, what's happening with McClellan's forces when they're in the, the same area here, um, you know, at the time. And what was interesting to me was that there were, Dix was operating in many of the same areas that McClellan was. And in 1863, a year later, there are still thousands and thousands of enslaved people that are willing to leave. Um, and, you know, they're also there helping out. But I think, you know, in my other books too, it, it, it's not, you know, it's just such an important part of the story. Um, and, I, you know, I think that most of the, you know, when you see kind of modern uh, studies, it, you know, it's something that um, most writers are going to deal with because it's, it's an important part of what happened. Right, right. And, and certainly the 
if the if the Union Army is a weapon for liberation, then these stories are going to surround every operation of the Union Army. And that might be another opportunity for these for historians who look at these topics, military operations that don't result in a big battle. Maybe the smoke from that battle keeps us from seeing all the other interesting things that are happening, such as people liberating themselves or uh, uh, or enslaved people working as guides, or on the other hand, the enslaved people working within the Confederate you know, ranks and things like that. That's where you're going to find some of that stuff. Well, we're about out of about out of time, Hampton. But I want to again tell everybody at home what a fascinating book this is. Gettysburg's Southern, Gettysburg Southern Front. I froze up there. Sorry about that. Gettysburg Southern Front. It's the story of a campaign that doesn't have a major battle. And as a result, there are just these fascinating stories that have large effects on the outcome of the war. And I think Gettysburg Southern Front is going to be a necessary, first of all, it's a fine book and a fine piece of history. It's going to be a necessary piece for a bookshelf of Gettysburg books. I don't think you understand the Gettysburg campaign until you understand what's happening at Richmond, both militarily, politically, and socially. Hampton, what do you have any final uh, any final ideas about that? I I think well, I, I really appreciate it. I, I appreciate the um, you know the thoughts about the book. I, I think what you're saying is kind of in line with what I discovered uh, in writing it, and it, you know it was a it was a real pleasure to do. But I I you know other than thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about it. I it's not. Um, I, it's not something I do all the time, you know, and uh, so to, to get a chance to talk about this is really great. I really well, appreciate it's, it. It's a, it's a real thrill to have you on the show, and I'm glad you came. What's this next idea? What's this next project? Appomattox, well, huh? I, 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 so my book projects are, I, I just kind of work on them and see what comes from it. I, I don't, you know, get contracts or anything like that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have written several books on things people have never heard about. And so I was thinking maybe I should write on something people have heard about. And I think uh, I'm in the early stages of researching and writing, and I'm hoping to do a military study of the campaign. Certainly there have been books on that, but um, at this point I'm looking to focus on kind of the uh, union command decisions and then uh, Lots of other uh, issues, kind of the you know issues we've been talking about here, parts of the story that may not have been told before um, in terms of that campaign. So uh, I'm in, enjoying it so far. That's kind of the important thing for me. When it stops being enjoyable, then maybe you find another project. So we'll right. see how it goes. Well, okay. Thank you very much. And for those of you at home, this brings us to the end of our 2022 calendar of A House Divided, a record-breaking year for A House Divided, where we had uh, 18 different House Divided programs. And some of those House Divided programs sold more than one book. So I don't even know how many books we featured this year, but I want to thank all of our authors who've been on A House Divided in 2022. And I especially want to thank you folks at home who have watched these programs, enjoyed these interviews, and most importantly, ordered the book. As I said at the beginning of this program, I think this is how book signings are going to be done, or a lot of book signings are going to be done from now on. And it's a fascinating way to use this media to talk about the book, to talk to the author, and for you to order signed first edition books, in this case, a first edition book signed on a custom book plate that we will deliver to your door. That's what we do at A House Divided. What about 2023? I don't know. I guess we're working on the calendar right now. That's for us to know and you to find out. So why don't you keep an eye on our social media? Keep an eye on our emails. 
and on our website, and you will soon know what we have scheduled for the spring of 2023 on A House Divided. Once again, Hampton Newson, thank you very much for joining us today. And everybody, we'll see you next time on A House Divided. Thank you.